Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, this is uh, a great event um, to have such a great turnout for tonight. My name is Carol Kavna. I'm chair of the Roads and Transportation Society. Um, our, I'd just like to point out the fire exits to you and uh, if you could please put your mobile phones to silent. Um, our presentation tonight is on the design, build, finance and operation of the N17 and 18 uh, PPP scheme, Gort to Tume. Um, co-hosted with uh, Civil Division, um, being delivered by Direct Road, Road Tume, Direct Route Tume under contract to TII. Uh, the Direct Route Consortium consists of Marguerite, Infrared Capital Partners, Roadbridge, Lagan, Strabag AG, John Sisk and Sun Holdings Limited. Our speakers tonight include Declan Carney, the PPP co-manager for the design and construction phase. He'll give an overview of the contract structure and the refinancing of the project. Uh, Declan's a quantity surveyor by profession and has been with John Siskin's son since 1995, involved in a number of PPP projects. He's seconded to the Direct Route uh, Consortium by Sisk, acting as general manager through the construction stage. Eamon Daly and Eamon O'Dee will give their shared experience with the PPP scheme. Eamon Daly is a chartered engineer with a ma master's in transportation engineering, currently a director at Barry Transport with 23 years experience in major hi highway projects, um, concentrating on project management, alignment, contract documents and drainage design. He project managed the detailed design delivery of 18 kilometres of the motorway type 2 dual carriageway for the Gort to scheme and is currently project manager for the development of the one of three trans-European <coughs> transport corridor projects in County Donegal. His experience of legal and procedural delivery aspects of consenting and, and is a proven expert witness. Imer O'D graduated from NUI Galway in 2005 and is an associate and chartered en civil engineer with Arab's infrastructure team. Since joining Arab, she's been involved in large road and infrastructure projects in Ireland and internationally. Her most recent projects include Cherrywood Town Centre and the Alignment Options Study for New Metro North. <coughs> and she was project manager responsible for the southern section of the M17, M18 Gort Tume PPP scheme in Galway. Our last speaker is Niall Lyons, the current PPP general man co general manager, who will give an overview of the operational and maintenance requirements for the scheme. Niall is qualified in construction management uh, with over 14 years' experience in the delivery operations and maintenance uh, field in a variety of engineering pro projects, both in Ireland, Australia and New Zealand, uh, the predominantly relating to PPP contracts. Um, Niall has joined Global Via as an operation and maintenance manager on the M6 PPP scheme um, and spent two years in Sydney with Pacific Partnerships, uh, CIMIC group. Um, projects included the setting up of a light rail operator, Canberra Metro, and Niall is presently with Roadbridge and seconded to the Directory Tume Limited as a general manager on this scheme. So I just hand over to Declan Carney now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending. Um, on behalf of the speaking panel, I would like to thank Engineers Ireland for the kind invitation to present to you this evening. It's a timely invitation as the uh, project opened to traffic a year ago this month, um, and thus is well established in the operations and maintenance phase, um, and allows a wider scope for the, for the presentation. The, N the M17 and M18 scheme is a signature piece of PPP infrastructure that will hopefully play a major part in wider regional development and economic growth along the Atlantic corridor, as well as satisfying the aims <coughs> of increasing road safety and significantly reducing journey times. Um, Carl has given you uh, an indication of how we structure the presentation. I'm just going to give you an overview of the uh, procurement and the contractual structure of the PPP scheme. Um, Eamon and Eamon will take you to, through some specific uh, design and construction challenges that we met in the scheme and Niall will take you through some of the operations and maintenance aspects of the project. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end um, so we can save questions till then. We'll be joined for the Q&A session by John Crowley who's the uh, construction joint venture manager on the scheme. So just to give you a sense of the scale of the project, um, it's a 57 kilometres uh, motorway that ran through, runs through predominantly greenfield rural landscape. 
on roughly a parallel alignment um, with the existing national roads um, of the N17 and N18. Uh, the project commenced at Gort, connecting to the existing uh, M18 Gort Crushine scheme um, and runs north to the north of Tume, where it connects to the existing N17 in the direction of Clamoris. And also part of the Tume bypass at the top, um, there is an intersection at Ballygaddy that uh, is future proofed to connect to the planned Tume Clamoris uh, section of the Atlantic Corridor. The motorway actually, um, its genesis was as uh, a combined was a combination of three road schemes, which were originally conceived um, and brought through the statutory planning process between uh, 1999 and 2007. Um, the three separate schemes were in different colours. There, the Tune Bypass was a 4.2 kilometre uh, dual dual carriageway. It was originally um, conceived as a one plus one, and that was brought through a Part Eight planning process by uh, Galway County Council. The 26 kilometre M17 section from uh, which was called the Galway to Tume scheme, which was CPO'd in 2007, and the uh, southern uh, aspect of the 27 kilometres Oranmore Gort, which was CPO'd in 2006. The project also contains uh, the black line is the M6. Uh, the project contains a major intersection, which is called the Rat Morrissey Interchange, um, and it's, it's probably the largest junction of its type in Ireland and would comprise a significant project on its own. Um, in terms of the procurement of the project, uh, this slide is a very interesting one. It contains a lot, a lot of information. Um, we could spend a lot of time on it, but I'll try and give a whistle-stop tour, um, given the time constraints that we have. Um, what the diagram does, it juxtaposes the timeline of the procurement of the project at its different stages against the construction industry's financial performance uh, over that time, which is demonstrated by the line through the diagram which is the graph of the annual GDP uh, figure for construction in the period. So as you can see, it peaks in 2007 to 2008 uh, before falling to its lowest point through 2012, uh, commencing an upward trajectory again as the wider economy slowly recovered <coughs> in those years. The N18 was originally put out to market, um, as you, get, you see the, the middle uh, peach box, if that's what the colour is. Uh, that was originally put out to market as a D&B scheme by the NRA as it was, um, but due to the, we went into serious economic refall, uh, free fall in that time, um, so the project got pulled because of the economic uncertainties and the unavailability of funding at the time. Um, but the public sector uh, still had an appetite to go ahead with the three schemes um, as part of a truncated capital expenditure at the time. Um, and the NRA uh, decided to combine the three projects and procure, procure them as a PPP project, as a single scheme. So the um, original documents came out in uh, 2009. Um, the stage one tender uh, was at the end of that year. Um, and they, the NRA uh, selected two consortia to go, ahead, to go forward and submit BAFOs um, in August 2010. Ultimately, uh, because of the financial crash at the time, neither tenderer could deliver a fully fin funded solution to achieve financial close. Um, this was more reluctance of lenders to fund into Ireland Inc. than it was with any uh, underlying principles in the project or uh, to do with the, the, the identity of the two bidders. Um, so the, uh, the NRA reverted to a second BAFO process and they replaced the fully funded solution with um, they, they issued um, an authority term sheet, that is they dictated the financial terms that would go into the tender and there was no requirement for uh, fully funded solutions. The second BAFA was submitted in August 2011 and direct routes were selected as the preferred tender at the time following the evaluation of the bids. Um, however, the NRA suspended the preferred tender or procurement process for a period of time while the economy was in the state that it was, um, but they reopened it again once it started an upward trend and when it was visible that some uh, external funding became available again, you can see that happening from 2013 onwards on the graph. Following the restarting of the preferred bidder, it still wasn't easy uh, to get the required quantum of funding at the time. Um, it was this, there was a significant uh, multi, multi, uh, hundreds of millions that were required for the project. Um, lenders who were, had previously been committed to Ireland and were interested in uh, investing in Ireland again as a market wanted others to, to lead the way first before they would commit. So it was a real chicken and egg 
uh, situation. But we eventually found um, lenders who uh, had sufficient capital that they uh, wanted to find a home for. And once we'd secured the funding in 2013, we had a very lengthy um, intensive phase of due diligence um, by the lenders in 2013 and uh, early 2014, which anyone that's dealt with EIB in the past will uh, understand. And we achieved financial close on the 30th of April 2014. Um, in the green boxes, we just said we we just decided to continue on the timeline here. Um, we spent the rest of 2014. Uh, we did anyone that lives in the area would see would see that there wasn't a real presence on site until the start of 2015. We spent the rest of that year uh, mobilising, doing detailed design, and uh, getting ourselves ready for the first artwork season um, in 2015. Um, <coughs> just. Uh, in terms of an overview of the timelines, um, the original program targets for the project that are shown in the in the table, um, we achieved them. Um, apart from completion, which we finished early, we finished uh, we got completion achieved completion on the nineteenth of December two thousand and seventeen. Um, the program itself ran reasonably smoothly. Uh, the main adverse event in the period of construction was uh, some flooding of the works in the winter of two thousand and fifteen into two thousand and sixteen. But we protected the program in that case. It, with 57 kilometres, it presented itself with opportunities to reschedule work and work from different uh, work faces at the time that weren't affected by flooding. In partnership with TII, um, which the NRA became during the period of the project by merging with the RPA, um, we worked together to achieve an early opening to traffic ahead of the official PTU. And um, as you can see from the picture, Minister Ross uh, performed the formal opening ceremony on the 27th of September last year and the road opened to its first public traffic that afternoon. Um, just, it's not on the slide, but to understand the effect on the region, I don't, I don't think it can be underestimated in the period that we were in, when we were in a very bad fiscal time. Um, it brought huge benefit uh, to, the, to the area. We had an average of 500 personnel per month um, employed on the scheme during the construction phase. Um, and that was at a monthly peak of uh, 900 people. And we told 3.75 million working hours over the construction phase. We analysed the numbers a couple of times on the on the project, and that indicated that approximately two thirds of the people working on the project at any one time were living in the region, and that brought significant benefits to the local economy, including service industries, um, at a time when investment in the west of Ireland was really, really scarce. Um, <coughs> this is the. I suppose a representation of what a typical contractual framework on a PDP model can look like, and it is complicated. There's a lot of uh, pieces of information. We, we generated around 200 pieces of separate contract documents for financial close. Um, but the model is based on fairly fundamental uh, principles in that the, um, if you look at the highlighted boxes in particular, the PPP Co, um, Directory Tum Limited, um, in this case finances, designs, bills, and then operates and maintains the, the motorway for 25 years following uh, the construction period. On this particular scheme, the PVP Co receives a monthly availability payment, um, which is used to operate the road and pay down the debt to the lenders uh, and provide a return <coughs> to investors. There are no tolls on the road. Um, the PPP Co sponsor group is made up of Marguerite Fund, uh, Infrared Capital Partners, Lagan, Rowbridge, Sisk and Strabag. Um, well, there are many interrelationships. Uh, the main relationships are, are between the entities uh, in the highlighted boxes. Um, the PPV Co's key relationships are obviously with the client, um, with the lenders who provide most of the funding in addition to the equity provided by the PPP Co sponsors. The funders in the, in originally um, were EIB, Natixis, Society General and Bank of Ireland. Bank of Ireland um, punched above their weight in the, um, as they took a leading role within the lenders, despite the fact that they actually had the, uh, the least amount of um, funding uh, staked in the project. The other main relationships are with the uh, construction joint venture and the O&M subcontractor, which I'll go through in more detail um, to give you a simplified, just to give you an idea of how we actually deliver the project um, in a simplified manner. Again, at the top, the, the TII contracted with the PPP Co. PPP Co in turn uh, contracts with the construction joint venture. In this instance, the construction joint venture was made up of four members of uh, PPP Co, or different arms of the, their companies, um, i.e. Lagan, Robridge, uh, Sisk and Strabag. Strabag, for you that don't know, are um, a large Austrian-based company. 
Um, in turn, the CJV, uh, the, the obvious challenge on the 57 kilometres is how do you actually uh, manage the logistics of delivering that? It's on a long, narrow site. It crisscrosses numerous uh, existing roads, rail lines, river crossings. And one of the unique challenges in this project was we had uh, 500 separate landowners um, living adjacent to the scheme um, who were discommoded in some way by the, by the main line passing through their properties. Um, we managed this challenge by splitting the site up into geographical sections rather than in an elemental way. And we assigned responsibility with those to the three delivery partners um, within the direct, uh, route team, direct route team as shown. Um, contractually, the DNC, co risks, the DNC risks from the PA were passed down in full to the delivery partners. And each of the three then engaged with the design joint venture, uh, Barry Transportation and Arab. Um, this was a variation on the earlier diagram just to show how it was split up. Um, while the lines aren't equidistant, uh, the project was divided up roughly um, in, in equal value in the three contracts. Um, Lagan section traversed the uh, main line from Gort to just north of the old Dublin Road, um, which is between Ormore and Loch Ray. Um, that incorporated the Kiltiernan interchange with the old uh, N18. Six session, Sisk section took it from uh, that point at the Old Dublin Road to the Arbert River, um, which is the end of the red line there, and that encompassed the uh, Rat Morrissey interchange um, with the M6. Robridge took the north section from the Arbert River to the end of the Tune bypass. That also included the interchange with the N63 uh, Galway to Common Road. I think that's a, that's a road that's being upgraded at, a, at the moment um, towards Roscommon. Um, while there was a geographical split between the three, uh, the activities entailed a considerable amount of interface between the three partners, uh, not least on access. Uh, Artworks Cut and Fill was a, a huge area of interface given where the rock locations were and the harvesting the same. Um, looked at section boundary interfaces and also the uh, a commonality in design and construction solutions so that it didn't look like three different projects. Um, while the overall design was delivered in an integrated way uh, by the, the, the design JV, Operationally, Barry Transportation delivered uh, the top half of the scheme and Arab delivered the south half. Um, Eamon and Nima will talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, one of the u unique things from a PPP perspective on the project, and um, was a very interesting one personally to be involved in, um, is a, it was a really unique situation where we had a refinancing of the project debt halfway through uh, construction in May 2016. Um, this is generally unheard of in the construction period because lenders like to have a uh, like to have um, operationals, uh, or the, sorry, the road in operations before they commit to such a um, to commit to such a refinancing. <coughs> Normally, in the construction period, re refinancings are had when uh, things go sour, um, as we've seen with uh, the Carillion situation. Um, but if we cast our mind back to April 2014 when we closed the project. Uh, the funding markets were, by, by and large, closed to Ireland, and the funds that were available were very high margins. I think they were, could have been four or five percent above um, uh, the basic euro bore rates at the time. But as we showed in the graph earlier, as, as the economy started going upwards, the lending markets um, started to come back into Ireland. Uh, money became more liquid, and uh, the pricing improved greatly. So it was clear to us that a refinancing opportunity existed that would deliver a very real saving to the authority and to the PPP co. Um, some of our existing lenders chose not to participate in the refinancing, um, not because of the project itself, but because of the, s the structure of their initial funding and the corporate positions on financing. The existing lenders in BOI, SOCGEN and Atixis all took increased debt stakes, and we had um, no difficulty sourcing um, a new tranche of funding from in institutional investors from Far and Wide, um, Babson Capital, who are a US company, Mayag from Germany, and Aviva Investors. The refi deliver, delivered savings based upon essentially cutting debt margins um, by 50%, and the authority benefited in line with the gain share enshrined in the project agreement, um, and they took their share of savings as a reduction in the annual availability payment. That's a whistle stop tour through the uh, contractual framework. Just very quickly on health and safety before I hand over to uh, Eamon and Nemer. Um, this is obviously, you know, as, as would be the case for any contractors, the, the key aspect for us on the project, our number one priority, and especially how we manage that across 57 kilometres. Um, we had dozens of initiatives uh, and other measures that were put into place in the project, um, only a handful of which are, are displayed on this sli slide. One of the main things we did was we 
to make sure that everyone could um, effectively contribute on health and safety, we established a project safety forum. So that involved all the stakeholders of the problem, Galway County Council, TII, um, as well as all the parties in PPP Co and the CJV. Um, this was convened once a, once a quarter. Um, we brought a mix of senior personnel from the stakeholders, but also we brought necessary representation of operatives working on the project itself so that we get their real contribution and provide a, a, a way of um, communicating um, health and safety issues back and forth with people working on the ground. Um, we had other simple um, effective ways of uh, or effective measures, including a common back hat for all supervisors so that everyone would know who was managing the works and who they could go to to talk about health and safety. Um, we had other aspects such as safety incentive scheme, um, stand-downs stand and safety days. One of the most one of the most effective ways we found of uh, getting a message on, on uh, health and safety across to people was through impact speakers, people who had suffered accidents themselves. Um, it gave people a very real sense of, you know, the it can't happen to me uh, scenario, um, and cut, cut through that sort of, uh, that sort of feeling. Um, I think I've overstayed my welcome, so I'm going to hand you over to uh, Amy. So design the construction. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, thank you, Declan. Uh, my name is Eamon Daly from Barry Transportation, and I'm going to present, uh, along with Eamon O'D from Arabs, on some of the design and um, construction challenges and solutions uh, on the project. Uh, we're going to cover the following topics today. Initially, uh, we look at the design team. Uh, we'll have a look at some general design challenges, and then we look at some specific um, design challenges listed on, on this slide. So the design joint venture consisted of a joint venture between Barry Transportation and Arup. The tender design was completed in 2010, and this formed uh, the conceptual design. Um, and as Declan noted earlier, Barry Transportation were designers for the northern half of the scheme and Arup were designers for the southern half of the scheme. The detailed design commenced in May 2014 with the preparation of a design manual. And this was to standardise uh, the design approach across the scheme. And just to give you a, a, an idea of the, the scale of the project in terms of design, at the, the peak of the design there was 93 office-based designers working on the scheme and 25 designer site representatives. Um, this slide just gives some uh, key information on the, the, the scale of the project. There was 53 kilometres of standard dual carriageway motorway, four kilometres of type two dual carriageway, which uh, was the tune bypass, four grade separated junctions, including a major junction with the M6 motorway. There was link roads, side road diversions, and numerous access roads. There was 71 principal structures, including road bridges, river bridges, rail bridges, foot bridges, accommodation bridges, and culverts. And there was 33 other structures, including retaining walls, gantry signs, and VMS signs. Then there was other ancillary works that you would associate with any uh, project. Uh, so what were the, the key design challenges? Uh, there was three contractors. Um, uh, as we noted earlier, it was Lagan, Roadbridge, and Sisk. There was two designers. Uh, so design consistency across the, the scheme was a, was a key challenge, and that's where, where we began with the, the early design manual to have a consistency of design. Uh, there was three separate design supervision teams with a head DSR um, overseeing all three. So consistency of supervision in terms of quality of inspections, um, raising of NCRs, closing out of uh, non-conformances, uh, again, was a, was a key challenge. Uh, the other, um, there are some specific um, um, challenges on this slide, which I'll go through as we go through the slide, such as uh, uh, peat, karst, uh, flooding, and environmental challenges. So I'll, I'll commence with, with flooding and drainage. Um, this uh, was flooding occurred in, in uh, November 2015, uh, and this flood occurred um, approximately five kilometres south of Tum, where the Clonkeen stream uh, crosses the, the, uh, the motorway. So you can see the, the Bailey Bridge there where the road footprint narrows, that's where the, the Clonkeen stream uh, is flowing across the, the, the motorway, and up around the, the my pointer working here. Up at the top left of the photograph is the Clare River, which is which has burst its banks. 
So this flooding also occurred, it's the same flood in November 2015, it's another location, it's, it's the Grange River, uh, and the Grange River also flows into the, um, to the Clare River, which is approximately one kilometre downstream of the, the proposed road. You can see this is quite early in the construction where the earthworks are, are being developed. Uh, so in terms of mitigation against flooding, one of the key objectives was not, was not to increase uh, flooding as a result of the, the road scheme. So there was a number of mitigation um, implied on the scheme. One was the provision of drainage blankets, which were a class 6B or 6C material, and they were placed to um, a minimum of 500 millimetres above, above known flood levels. In terms of road design levels, the vertical alignment was set to a minimum of, of one metre above known flood levels and flood relief culverts were provided at key locations uh, at flood areas. In terms of road drainage itself, there was I suppose, three key objectives. One was the speedy removal of surface water from running carriageways. Uh, the second was the minimisation of uh, the risk of, of pollution and flooding of receiving water bodies, including measures to minimise the risk of accidental spillages causing pollution and to provide significant removal of, of suspended solids and other contaminants. And the, the third was to, to remove subsurface water to protect pavements and associate earthworks. So in terms of the speedy removal of surface water, this generally relates to, to pavement gradient. And issues can arise uh, where road transitions from a normal camber, which are straight sections of road, to super elevated or curved sections of road. So on sections of road where the longitudinal gradient is at or about 1%, uh, flasp, FASPOS can occur at, at these areas. So on the N17 and N18 scheme, the solution was to uh, provide rolling crowns. And rolling crowns are the application of super elevation along a diagonal crown line across the carriageway. Uh, and this um, uh, crown line maintains a 2.5% gradient on the pavement either side of the crown line. Uh, one of the key things with them is that they need to be sufficiently long to achieve a satisfactory ride quality and particular care needs to be taken with the, with the construction. And you can see this is, this is an example on a scheme where we, we did a report on, on, on all the, the rollover areas. Applying the normal method of super elevation, these are contours here. You can see the contours are getting quite wide apart. They're 10 millimetre wide contours. Uh, 10 millimeter difference con contours and you can see that you have a potential for a flat a flat spot in this area and this is where we apply a rolling crown and this is the rolling crown line up along here so you have two and a half percent fall there two and a half percent fall this way and you can see the contours then are all falling and they're quite close together which eliminates any flat spots uh, in terms of the road drainage systems as uh, two distinct types of road drainage systems. One was uh, uh, sealed drainage systems and the other was, was unsealed drainage systems. And due to the, the vulnerability uh, of the, the groundwater in the area uh, in the vicinity of the scheme, uh, large extents of the, of the scheme were, were sealed drainage areas. So we had approximately 47 kilometres of scheme was a, was a sealed drainage um, system. And the sealed drainage systems employed were generally a curb <coughs> slot drain, curb and gully, a combined curb drainage units, and the median drainage was a, was a, a slot drain generally. Uh, filter drains were also provided, but they, they were only to, to uh, uh, deal with uh, groundwater levels, control groundwater levels, and uh, they were all only for non-contaminated runoff. And this photograph in detail just shows you one of the as-constructed slot drains on the, on the scheme. In terms of non-sealed areas, uh, the scheme drain is generally achieved using over-the-edge drainage or filter drains. Uh, in terms of uh, pollution control, a number of different methods were employed in the design and construction. Sill trap gullies and cash pits were used throughout the scheme where possible. Uh, bypass uh, petrol and island interceptors were used at each outfall location. Uh, attenuation ponds, infiltration ponds uh, were provided at each outfall and pollution control forebays were provided at all attenuation and infiltration ponds. Uh, the N17 N18 uh, project had both infiltration and attenuation ponds and infiltration ponds were more predominant on the southern end of the scheme and this is due to the fact that land in this part of the scheme generally drains uh, to groundwater. 
and uh, I suppose to, just to, to, to show you that, that there's between the southern tie in at Gert and approximately 42 kilometres northwards to the Abbott River, there's only two river crossings on the scheme the Clarence Bridge and the Dunkellen River. Everything else drains, drains to ground. There's no water courses or, or drainage ditches. So, on the northern section of the scheme, there's more water courses, and, and subsequently, there was more attenuation ponds discharging to, to surface waters. This is a, a particular example um, at Kiltiernan Junction. Um, a constructed wetland and soakway system was provided uh, to provide additional treatment um, to infiltration water due to the proximity of the Kiltiernan SAC and water supply system. So this consisted of a, an initial spillage containment area with a, 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 a minimum volume of 50 metres cubed, which discharged into a lined constructed wetland. Uh, this comprised specific planting and internal berms to disp disperse the water uh, to help and pr to promote settlement uh, in, in the pond. Uh, this then um, uh, outfalled to a, uh, via a weir to a, an infiltration um, pond system. Uh, mo just moving on to, uh, to soft ground on the scheme then. Uh, in ter one area of soft ground was in the vicinity of Tume and south of Tume where there was approximately three kilometres of of, of soft ground. Um, there was peat um, uh, which had depths up to 4.6 metres uh, with an average depth of 2.1 metres and this was underlain lay lay by um, soft marrows and uh, the clustering clays which had depths up to up to 10 metres. So the, the design solution was to excavate the peat and to surcharge the soft ground below that. Uh, and it, it, this was done by um, the provision of, of installing band drains at, at uh, one metre centre. So there was approximately one million metres of, of band drains installed on the project. And this is just a, a photograph of a band drain, which is a hundred millimetre wide um, drain. And what this does is it, it promotes, it, it helps to bring the, uh, the surcharge, the water back up uh, faster than it would do in clays. Uh, so what you do is we, we, it was a, a layer of stone um, laid over the, the excavated peat area on the soft ground and the band drains were then installed. And just what a, a vertical band drain looks like. Um, it's uh, as high as, uh, as the deepest section of soft ground. Um, it, it, they, they have um, GPS systems within them so they record the, the locations and levels of all the band drains which are were great for the production of as built um, following the installation. Um, the, the ground was, was uh, then um, loaded in, in 600 millimeter lifts of material with generally a three to four month hold period. Uh, they were monitored constantly uh, and once the settlement had occurred, the next lift went on and their embankments were, were placed in up to, up to six and seven meter high embankments. So the predicted uh, settlement matched what was achieved on, on site. Uh, there was some significant rock cuts on the, on the project. Um, there was approximately 1.8 million metres cubed of rock excavation. So the majority of this was, was blasted and then it was um, excavated by machine to achieve the, um, the slope angle, which was 1 to 0 0.5. I just have a video clip here of one of the um, the blast, which I hope will work.
Okay, um, as Eamon has had listed earlier, um, cars was one of the main design challenges on the scheme. Um, one of the, I suppose the first tasks that was carried out as part of this was a cars risk assessment and preparation of standard detailed um, designs. So on the left hand side, you'll see some of the um, tools that were used as part of the desktop study. We've got um, GSI geology maps and uh, cars landforms via ArcGIS. And on the right then, um, a site walkover was also carried out. And this was done to try to identify any new features that wouldn't have shown up in the desktop study, such as those shown in the photographs on the right. Once this was done, then the scheme was, was split up into sections of one kilometre length. And the risk assessment was carried out based on overburden um, cover, rock type, um, density of cars and proximity to the scheme. As a result of this, um, this showed that over 95% of the scheme would actually require blanket geotextile. And also a high percentage of structures would require piling. On the left is um, what's called a karst protocol. This was developed um, to allow the site team to assess each karst feature um, as they encounter them on site to try to reduce this risk. It's based on the site team following a protocol of following a series of questions, starting with from whether this feature was identified as part of the desktop study, carrying out topsoil strips, um, trial pits, speaking to landowners, getting any anecdotal evidence. Uh, before escalating to carrying out additional GI. And on the right then is just um, one of the standard details that would have been developed to treat um, situations both in cut or fill. As a result of carrying out um, this or employing this risk protocol, um, we were able to reduce the requirement for um, blanket geotextile from 95% down to less than 20%, which obviously gave significant savings, um, and it was also used to assess the risk and develop solutions at bridge locations where karst was discovered. The next few slides that I'm going to go through is just a few of the structures where karst was discovered and how the situation was dealt with. So the first one is uh, called OB89. It's an accommodation overbridge on the southern section where the main line is in cut. Um, when the excavation was carried out um, adjacent to the structure, Karst features were uncovered. Uh, they're shown in the photographs there. Um, geophysics were carried out at both the West and Central Pier um, to try to determine the nature of the, of the features. And as a result of this, it was determined that there was uh, quite large voids um, in place. So um, our task was to present some options to the, the contractor. And as part of that, um, develop scenarios based on the type of feature. So you've got scenario A, uh, which would be if it was a small feature, which could be backfilled and then um, a slab spanning over the top. Scenario B is a large, um, a larger feature, but it's infilled with overburdened rock, so we would have had to design skin friction piles. And then scenario C is again a large feature, but um, with rock present, and that would have been rock socketed piles. Uh, scenario A, based on ge geophysics, could be um, ruled out because the features were large. So um, piled solutions were presented to the contractor based on scenarios B and C. Um, but however, it was deemed that due to risks during construction in forming a working platform to put in the piles, that these were not viable solutions. And so we looked at um, possibly moving the bridge. So you can see from um, the excerpts from the mapping on the top left that the structure actually spans between two access tracks that run parallel to the main line. And because of the way they're orientated and the LMA in this area, we were actually able to just slide the bridge along um, to a more suitable location. So further GI um, was carried out to try to help us pick that. And after a few options were presented, the decision was made to relocate the bridge 20 metres to the north. The next bridge is um, called Balnafwil Overbridge. It's on the M17. Um, in this situation, a large void was encountered, uh, 12 metres by 8 metres. If you look at the photograph on the right, you'll see a jeep circled at the top right, just to give you a bit of scale. Um, this feature was filled in with clay, which indicated that it was inactive. 
However, above it, there were eight um, karst conduit features that were approximately 600 mil wide with uh, smooth edges, which showed that water was still flowing through the features. And so the voids were considered still active. As the design was already issued to site, uh, we were restricted to a five millimeter settlement limit, the central pier. So um, for the inactive void, so the larger void at the bottom, this was infilled with class 6N2 material and blinded with concrete, thereby recreating a like for like situation. And then above this, the active con conduits were backfilled with half a meter no fines concrete, which let the groundwater continue to flow through. And then the re remaining depth was backfilled with concrete to the underside of the pier. Uh, the next location is on the Tune Bypass. It's the Balagadi Overbridge. Um, listed on the right are the explorations that were carried out to try to determine the nature of the features. Uh, in the photographs you can see, it was a large active linear karst feature. Um, this one was filled with saturated, um, saturated sand and it was three and a half meters wide and over 20 meters in length. The depth to rock beneath the feature um, was 13, to solid rock, sorry, was 13 meters. To determine um, the best course of action, uh, geophysics were carried out. So uh, resistivity profiles and ground penetrating radar was used to verify the location of the feature. And then additional drilling was used to determine um, the ground conditions where the foundations would be placed. The void was infilled with class six material. And then a span was designed, or a slab was designed to span the feature that would then support the overlying structure. Moving on to pavement design, uh, the main line was was designed using analytical um, techniques, and then the non-project roads um, were done using the standard method from the DMRB. <coughs> analytical design is quite common on PPP projects and is based on using the information that you have about site one materials to get specific material properties to allow you to basically de design a thinner pavement to carry higher loads. Um, it's based, as I said, on using um, t testing of the materials in situ, um, but because of this, it requires no negative tolerances during construction, which is different to standard method, which allows for negative tolerances in, in uh, accordance with the specification. So very strict QA is required on site to achieve your required design depths without any negative tolerance allowed. So flexible composite uh, was chosen over fully flexible because of the availability of site one aggregate in the form of limestone rock. Um, this presented the opportunity to have a sustainable use of the material and is also obviously cost efficient. Um, in terms of designing for the flexible composite in areas of soft ground, the foundation CBR 50% had to be proved and the settlement was extended uh, for primary and secondary settlement to to maintain surcharge beyond the design period. There was also geosynthetics used in the pavement layers to provide extra strength. And the requirement for cracking, uh, induced cracking in the CBGM layer was reduced from three meters to two meters. All of this was required um, to reduce the potential for settlement or reflective cracking. This slide just gives you a comparison of what the design would have been for standard in comparison to the analytical design that was presented. So as you can see, it achieved a 20 mil saving in your asphalt layers and also a reduction in your foundation material requirements. Moving on now to uh, some of the environmental challenges. Um, the scheme passes through a number of, um, or adjacent to a number of SACs and encroaches into their catchments. Um, they're listed here. So you've got the Loch Carib, uh, Cool Garilan Complex, Kiltiernan and Rahasan, and also um, traverses a number of their tributaries, uh, such as the Abbott River, Grange River, and Dunkellan River. It's also ad adjacent uh, to a number of nationally rare plants, which are listed there. This slide just shows you some of the photographs of the protected species whose habitats um, would have been located um, within or adjacent to the scheme. And this slide just shows you some of the, the um, mammals that would have actually used the mammal underpasses once they were in operation. So there's badgers, foxes, and a rabbit or a hare. Um, the EIS required that the construction of the scheme was done in accordance with the guidelines for the treatment of bats during the construction of national road schemes, which is a DMRB document. Um, consultation was also carried out during detailed design and construction with Bat Conservation Ireland. 
and this was to determine um, the most appropriate uh, planting for early landscaping works, but also for bat hopover points, which are basically diamond shaped planting adjacent to the scheme consisting of um, existing or uh, semi mature trees, which guide the bats over the main line, basically. There's also for the river under bridges, uh, stone cladding and bat boxes provided to give opportunities to all bat species to provide or to start roosts, basically. One of, I suppose, the most notable environmental mitigation measures that was employed was for the lesser horseshoe bat. So this bat is of an international importance and it's because its uh, populations have dramatically declined in Ireland and have actually gone extinct in a number of locations across Europe. As a result of this, um, the contract required that a green bridge or bat bridge be constructed. It stipulated that this would be a buried structure in the form of a twin arch, um, which allowed the uh, hedgerows basically to be planted across the top. These served to guide the bats um, across the scheme to feeding grounds on either side and also to roosting sites in Kiltartan Cave. Moving on to structures, um, once again, this is the, the cool green bat bridge. Uh, as I said, it's a twin arch precast concrete buried structure with sloping elevations which were topsoiled and landscaped. The excerpt on the left just shows some of the lifting arrangements for the arches as they were, um, for, during construction and on the right shows the arches in place before they were buried. Moving on to the Balagadi overbridge. Uh, this is the same bridge that uh, I showed earlier in terms of the karst features that were discovered. Uh, the concept design at the time was for cambered steel beams. Um, this was to deal with a long variable depth for the bridge beam because the, crest, the design required a crest curve of 330 meters. However, during detailed design following um, consultation with the contractor, it was decided to proceed with a concrete beam this is to be consistent with other structures across the scheme, um, which afforded opportunities for efficiencies during construction. The final solution was an innovative precast concrete pretensioned super Y beam. Um, the span of the bridge is 40 meters. It's 16 meters wide and on a skew of 16 degrees. Uh, the beams are of varying depth, which forms a parabolic top profile, but gives you a level beam soffit. So the excerpt at the bottom, you can see straight line in the bottom, but then a curved, curved soffit. And the cross section then is provided of the super Y beam on the right. And finally, um, Rathmorrissey Junction. As was mentioned earlier, this is one of the most significant junctions on the scheme. And in fact is probably the biggest junction in Ireland. It uh, is a three level motorway to motorway interchange. It is a, um, has a circuit to carriage that's over a kilometer long, which is making it the longest in Ireland. Um, during detail, during tender and detailed design, optimization was carried out try, to try to determine the most efficient shape for the circular carriageway. Um, as a result of the optimization, we settled on an oblong shape as being the most efficient. This allowed us to reduce earthworks heights, but also allowed us to, re to reduce radii on structures, which meant that they could be widened or their their spans were could be reduced. So steep and slopes were used to reduce the earthworks and in total a reduction of approximately 100,000 metres cubed of material was achieved. Five structures were required to form the junction, uh, three underbridges carrying the M18 main line over the circulatory carriageway and the existing M6. And any structures then that were placed over the M6 had to be single span because no works were allowed in the median um, as it was a live motorway. So the beams were installed at night time um, using rolling closures on the eastbound and closures and local diversions on the westbound. So the photographs on the right just show some of the beams um, being placed. I think that's me. So I'll hand over to now. <coughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm Niall Lyons. I'm the general manager uh, of Direct Route Tume. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the operations and maintenance phase of the contract. Gone the wrong way there. So as Declan mentioned earlier, it's a 25-year O&M contract uh, for the project road. <clears throat> it's important to note that the project road is, uh, the project road is actually smaller in extent than the road constructed. 
That's because uh, parts of the road constructed were handed back to local authority, namely the Tune Bypass. It's an availability based contract, which means that there's no, no tolling on the road and that the PPP call receives its revenues from monthly, uh, from uh, PPP call receives its, its revenue based on the availability of lanes uh, from the authority. The O and M requirements are set out in Schedule 7 of the contract, which are very prescriptive uh, maintenance and inspection requirements. And what I mean by that, it, uh, it defines very clearly the grass height must be no higher than 300 mil in the verge. You cut the grass 1.2 meters wide. You must check the torque on the all bolts and the safety barrier every 24 months. And that's done for each individual asset. It's very prescriptive. The operations are carried out in accordance with the TAI publications and traffic science manual. So the PPP Co awarded uh, O&M contract uh, for the term uh, of tw uh, for 25 years to the O&M contractor who is Away Lagan Infrastructure Services, also known as Alice. The PPP Co has retained the responsibility for life cycle works. The O and M contractor carries out the cyclical maintenance. Right. So, in order to provide the O and M services, the O and M contractor needed to procure extensive plant and equipment before the road opened, uh, a winter maintenance fleet, crash cushion vehicles, uh, maintenance trucks, maintenance vans, and uh, grass cutting equipment, etc. So, this is all held in a centrally located maintenance depot, which is in Atten Rye which is in the center of the scheme, exactly halfway between Gort and Tume, which allows us to quickly access the north and the south of the scheme. The, the O and M contractor employs uh, uh, all these staff are locally, uh, are from the locality. And uh, si similarly, uh, local specialist subcontractors are used for pavement testing, plant hire, etc. So winter maintenance is one of the key requirements of the O and M contract. So where there's uh, forecast conditions for us, for ice, frost or snow, uh, precautionary treatment uh, is carried out. And this is done by with the project road divided up into three winter maintenance routes, uh, all of which must be completed within two hours. Uh, the duty officer is the decision maker. He decides what the treatment is going to be, what time the treatment is going to be made. Uh, we use a pre-wet system, which is uh, dry salt is mixed with a brine solution before it is applied to the road. Uh, the advantages of this is it reduces the overall salt consumption. It uh, increases the activa activation time uh, for the de-icing material and it's effective at lower temperatures. And the plant and equipment is li listed there for the, which are required for winter maintenance. Storm Emma was a key event for us at the start of the year, and in particular, the latter part of the storm uh, in the west of Ireland from the 28th of February to the 2nd of March. Uh, so the key, uh, we, were, we, were, we were very proud that we managed to keep all lanes o open at all times, and this was done with, uh, uh, in some particular, uh, we had some particular I, 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 some particular I, I, I issues at the time, namely that the local roads were uh, impassable in several in several places. So what we done is we uh, arranged for our winter maintenance staff to stay in a local hotel, and uh, effectively we had uh, uh, winter maintenance vehicles on the road uh, plowing snow and uh, applying grit on the road for three days uh, solid. And once they finished their shift, they go to get some rest in the hotel, and then they would return return to site. Uh, so whilst we managed to keep all the lanes o o open, the interesting thing is that there was no cars on the road because uh, everyone had been advised to stay home for a couple of days. So motorways were nice and clear, but there was no cars on it. Um, asset management. So uh, our MMS is a routine maintenance management system. So this is the key tool for any O and M contract. And the RMMS system, which we use, is Steen Solutions GeoWorks, uh, and we use it for uh, all all the assets, excluding structures and major uh, renewal of pavements. So all the all the 
the inventory um, on the project road is recorded via an as-built service and it's inputted into the RMMS. Um, additionally, the contract requirements for safety inspections and detailed inspections is also, is also inputted into the RMMS. And what the system then does, it, it prompts the O and M contractor to go out and carry out a detailed inspection or a safety inspection. The network inspector will go out on site with a mobile device. He carries out his inspection. Any, any of the defects uh, which are identified are recorded and uh, will be are uploaded into the system. So uh, each defect has to be categorized. Category one is uh, imminent and uh, imminent risk to the road user, so it needs to be rectified within 24 hours. You have a category two high or medium or low or category three. So the um, the RMS system based on the category uh, category of the defect will prompt the O and M contractor to uh, create a work order and to uh, rectify rectify the the defect. So structures maintenance, so we have 75 structures on the project road. You'll note that number is different than what you've seen on the slide earlier from Eamon. Uh, that is because, as I explained, the project road, the extent is different uh, than what was constructed. And additionally, we have included the gantries uh, as structures here. So the PPP code uses the authorities bridge management system, which is Airspan. And Airspan requires us to, uh, or the Airspan manuals requires us to carry out weekly weekly inspections and annual routine inspections and principal inspections every six years. So typically what we would do is an approved uh, structures inspector will ins inspect all the bridge stock in a given month during the summer and then that uh, the results of the inspections are uh, put into the airspan system and the work orders created are closed out over the next 11 months. Uh, emergency response so this is the bread and butter of a O and M contractor uh, and the, the key requirement is that we have to have an emergency response team available 24 hours a day to uh, to uh, facilitate any necessary lane closures and the attendance is in a maximum of one hour and one and a half hours outside of normal working hours. So in order to do so you must have uh, the required plant and equipment must be uh, available at all times and your lane closures can vary from a hard shoulder closure lane one to lane two all very straightforward and it gets more complicated if it's a full motorway closure and you've seen a couple of pictures of Rat Morrissey Junction so you could have two junctions to close so it gets more complicated so in order to do this the O&M contractor must liaise very closely with the emergency services and adjacent maintenance contractors namely the Mark B, JV, N6 operations who operate the M6 PPP scheme and Galway County Council so the reason why we build motorways uh, besides from uh, improving journey time is also to improve road safety so the coll collision rate on the old n17 and n18 was 0 0.29 so coll collision rate per kilometer on the old n17 and n18 was 0 0.29 2014 the collision rate up until the 31st of august uh, on the m17 m18 is 0 0.16 now I don't have the stats for what the what the collision rate on the old road is for the last twelve months, um, so we'll just have to go with this for now. Uh, so of the sixty-one road traffic accidents we've had on the motorway, there's an equal spread of reasons for that: uh, driver error, uh, hail. Hail is a is a uh, is a difficult one because what we find is uh, during a, period, a heavy hail shower, uh, you could have a number. Of accidents at the same time you could typically you could have four or five at the same time they all they, that all need to be responded to and the emergency services have uh limited capacity so uh, we it can be difficult at, at, at times and the other major cause is unknown so typically we'd come across a, a barrier strike or signage damage uh that hasn't been reported or a driver can explain what the reason for the accident was there was uh, so pavement is the main asset in any motorway scheme unless there's some uh, extra special uh, tunnels or bridges 
Uh, so we test uh, skin resistance is tested each year. Uh, lane one is tested each year, lane two every second year. The contract sets out minimum scrim coefficient values based on the road type. Is it on the main line? Is it on a roundabout? Is it an approach to a roundabout? And it sets out uh, investigatory levels. So if the scrim coefficient is above the investigatory level, the, there is a deemed to be no, no, no issue with skid resistance. Um, if it's below, we need to investigate and determine if uh, um, some improvement works are required. Uh, we also carry out pavement testing using the road surface profiler, and this we test the uh, rideability of the road with the International Roughness Index. Rideability is, is the measurement, uh, texture with mean profile depth and the rut depth. Um, all of these are measured at the same frequency as the scrim. And similarly, the, there's minimum performance and investigatory levels are set out in the contract and in the TII standards. And uh, every four years, we uh, test the structural capacity of the pavement using a falling weight deflectometer. And finally, the life cycle and handback requirements. Uh, so the thing about the PPP scheme is uh, at the end of the contract, uh, there is handback requirements or handback conditions that must be achieved. And the threshold on the PPP scheme is quite high. So effectively, the authority is getting back a new motorway at the end of the concession period. Uh, in order to achieve this, uh, Direct Route 2 have a life cycle model, which we use to determine the maintenance and renewal requirements to make sure we achieve the handback condition. Uh, a number of assets which will require replacement prior to handback include the pavement. So there's extensive minimum performance levels must be achieved. There must be res residual life at 10 years at handback. Fencing, there's a residual life requirement at 10 years. Safety barrier, residual life requirement at 12 years and so forth. And Okay, that was the brief overview of the O&M requirements. So I think uh, that's the end of our presentation. Uh, and I think we'll take some questions. Thank you very much. Firstly, I'd like to congratulate our, our speakers, Declan Eamon and Emer and Niall. And I think John Crowley is here as well on the delivery of, of a significant piece of infrastructure. There are some very difficult site conditions to have overcome. Um, I imagine you've all had lovely peat fires for the last uh, number of years. Um, we'd like to open the floor now to any questions. Um, I'm conscious of time, so we might keep it to 10 minutes if we can. But are there any questions um, from the floor? Don't be shy. Um, if I'll start, start something off, um, I suppose just in relation to um, maybe moving of the structures, uh, did that involve some renegotiation of, of land take with some of the landowners? Or is that... No, um, OB89, the orientation of it meant yeah. that it could be moved between the access tracks without actually going outside the LMA. It was still okay. served the same landowner. I have a, a question. Yeah. Uh, in the past, I've worked with uh, wood trains and preloading. Um, so obviously, you had a lot of soft ground uh, along the site. Did you have to do any trials at any point? Did you do any small trials to understand? Did you fail anything on purpose? Was there any? Uh, there was no, no specific trial done. There was a lot of uh, analysis and design done. And uh, we started monitoring. So there was uh, extensive monitoring of the pore water pressures. Uh, throughout the job, so they were, they were monitored uh, on a daily basis. So and then all the results were fed back to the design team. Uh, and once the settlement had occurred on that section, we moved forward. We, we were predicting what we predicted what was it was three to four months for each lift, and that work that work is happening on site now. Obviously, the contractors were were, were keen to push on. They were applying pressure to move forward, um, but we, we held it to we were satisfied. Uh, with the um, uh, with the settlement at each layer before we, before next the next lift went on. Yeah, I was going to suggest that the uh, obviously to a to a design program or construction program, sitting and waiting uh, to, to, to get the settlement out of the ground uh, is very tricky when you're on a critical path. So obviously everything went, it went uh, yeah. as close as it could to it your projections. It went as close and and uh, 
the construction period and, and the scale of the project allowed for a, a, a settlement solution in this case and it's not always possible because there are time pressures in terms of program usually that may uh, preclude the use of a settlement solution. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> yes. What's the payment design life? 40 years. 40 years. Okay. Yes. Um, I suppose from a design perspective, the first thing that we did was we spent about six weeks developing what was called the design manual. So it, it was the document that captured <coughs> the design parameters um, and inputs, but also set out what the contractors would require themselves in terms of the outputs um, and agreed, you know, standard details, things like that. So there was it allowed a lot of consistency across the scheme, but obviously there were site specific details that had to be agreed as well, but they would have been circulated. Um, within the team to see if they, they, they applied elsewhere, but generally that task was done up front, so it allowed, allowed us to kind of progress with the design without having to do too many iterations and going back around the houses. And was there a lot of use for the same subcontractors? So uh, in design, we had the same, we would have the same contract subcontractors across uh, all sections except for third party uh, checkers. John, can talk construction. In terms of construction, I suppose <coughs> the design is reasonably consistent in the, the, the end result tends to follow. Just to follow on your, your, your follow on question in relation to the subcontractors, we, we had some common subcontractors between the north and the centre section, some common subcontractors between the centre and the south section. But generally, the scale of the project was such that we actually needed to, uh, I suppose, to. Uh, involved with a group of different contractors to actually get through all the work in the entire time. So I suppose the end result was that uh, we were all working to a consistent design, consistent set of design, uh, construction standards, consistent quality manual across the project, consistent environmental standards. <coughs> the result is that I think you end up with a, a project that looks the same from the experience. Yes. Uh, did you have any problems with building across the bog, particularly in Seven Two? Um, that mean that? Yeah, like I think it, it's uh, uh, again described there. The overall program was, was pretty relaxed. It wasn't a, a very tight program from our perspective. You, you'll gather there that we, we we were able to spend seven or eight months at the start, uh, pretty you know completing our detailed design. Um, our overall construction on site program was about 33 months, which actually gave us the time to, to accommodate all the settlement theories that uh, Ian had talked about there. So the, the, the real, I suppose the, the challenge was to get the design uh, completed initially, get it approved and get on with the construction er early in the project. Uh, we, we did that reasonably well and it meant we, we, we pretty well had used the full time from January 15 right through actually to about June, June, June 17 to allow all those settlements to take place and, 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 and give the contractor the time. So effectively we had uh, nearly 30 months to manage that and that, that I suppose took some of the pressure out of that. And, The other challenge, I suppose, there that, that Wayne didn't touch on too much was that we, we had about 200,000 feet of uh, feet to dispose of. Um, again, the, the contractor there, uh, we ran back to Woodbridge, uh, worked um, uh, a couple of um, uh, disposal areas adjacent to the site. Uh, all the feet went in there and kept the back and look there at the moment, the heat, heat settles over time when it when it rains uh, and there are a couple of uh, disposal areas there that effectively look almost exactly as they did just before any feet was put in there to increase in levels it is, it is uh, you know, not workable. 
Yeah, question over here. Two part question. One, now that the road has been open for 12 months, what's the traffic volume using it? And two, whether there's been major diversions, as for instance, do you know whether traffic going from Castle Bar to Dublin is now using this motorway to join the M6 and come to Dublin rather than going down the long length of the M5? Which was the original intention? Uh, yeah, so uh, the <coughs> average daily traffic at the moment is 11,500, is the average across the scheme of all the sections. Uh, I would say that the traffic volumes on the southern section are performing better and stronger than the traffic on the northern section. A lot of the traffic on the northern section, uh, there's additional, additional, uh, additional infrastructure to be completed in a call with the call with city bypass and when that's completed i think that the traffic traffic volumes on the northern section will increase more and i think maybe a last question here thanks uh, two things uh, the auto rock that was excavated was that just used solely in earthworks or was that really crushed uh, for mechanical uh, pavement and also uh, what's the psv of the final surface Okay, thank you very much. Um, there was some, certainly some uh, fabulous uh, drone footage as well included in there that people can go and look at afterwards. Um, and a couple of, of interesting ideas to take away, certainly from a health and safety viewpoint. The impact statements, uh, I'd say, are, are a very good idea. The impact speakers. And um, I'll have to go and find out more about the brine batching. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, our next lecture in Roads and Transportation Society is on Wednesday, the 10th of October. Uh, please keep an eye on our uh, roads and transportation page on the Engineers Ireland website. Um, I'll now call on, on behalf of uh, the Roads and Transportation Society and the Civil Division, I'll call on uh, Ali Gleeson uh, from PMC to give the vote of thanks. Uh, well, you'd be delighted to know there is no vote. Um, <laughs> and if, if there were, I suspect it would be very unanimous. Um, that was an excellent presentation and an incredibly comprehensive Yet, despite the amount of information that you had in there, at no point did you did, did I, I feel it was rushed. At no point did I feel like I was falling behind. So, uh, a massive congratulations to you for pulling through uh, what was a, a very, very complex project and, and condensing it into an hour, uh, which you did finish on time. So your record is still uh, is still very good. So uh, well, well done. It, it also had a fantastic balance, I think, and this is something that we we tend uh, not to do very well as engineers, but it had a fantastic balance of text, pictures. Uh, photographs and, uh, and and figures uh, and the fact that you you managed not only to get in an explosion um, in the presentation which is, <laughs> which is always going to uh, get bums on seats but the fact that you got her own walk-on centre uh, well, uh, I think sets the, the trend for the next two presentations um, I just just as an aside my, my daughter last week asked me what an engineer does uh, which is a surprisingly <laughs> tricky question um, after really 20 tricky. years of, of engineering but I tried to explain to her that it, it's teams of people designing stuff and building stuff. Uh, and I think PPPs are, are the true essence of that, where you have teamwork. And I think we, we, t we take it for granted as engineers uh, that teamwork is something that we naturally do. It's, it's not something that other industries or sectors do very well. But I think here we have three contractors, two designers, local authorities, TII, sponsors, everybody coming together in a very concerted uh, um, uh, fashion to deliver. Uh, not only uh, an initial financial package, but then to have the good sense to, to go and, and find additional financing 
um, to create even more value. Um, I, I'm not certain other sectors would have done that um, in the industry. So uh, on behalf of everybody here, uh, I would maybe just like to ask everybody to thank uh, these, our team specialists in the usual way. Thank you. <laughs>